This story gets told a lot at the department that I used to work for. After it happened, I'm pretty sure we actively talked about it for like almost a year straight. Just about every shift, we were all like, what the fuck? Then, I got tired of telling the story when we would bid a new shift and I'd work a new station to the new firefighters, medics or EMTs who would ask me about it. I'm now a firefighter paramedic about 250 miles north of where I used to work. Have been since 2017. And so, enough time has gone by where I've sort of buried what I can't understand and I've reasoned with what I should understand. But it's a nice treat for you guys, so here it goes. So, the shift started at 1900 hours and our shift ended at 0700 the following day. My partner Brandon and I worked this unit for quite some time. It was a busier unit. We got along really well though, probably too well to be honest. Can't believe we never got fired for the stupid shit that we'd say and do. But anyway, we would mostly drink Red Bulls and play the circle game and punch each other in the arm and see how many nurses' phone numbers that we could get before they all hated us. It was a glorious time, if I'm being honest. Our area was in the outskirts of downtown, and I won't say the city, but it's as southwest as you can go in the US before you're in Mexico. So there was a rather large incident that occurred while we were offloading one of our patients. Instead of being dispatched to the incident, we were sent to cover a district for another ambulance who had to respond on our behalf. The district was rural, straight up BFE, you could smell salsa in the air and pretty sure the radio switched to Spanish at one point, and yeah, I think you get the picture. Brandon knew of a 24 hour taco shop and we stopped there to grab some food. I bet him $20 that he couldn't eat his burrito in less than two minutes, and I literally watched him inhale it, choke on it, and pull a piece of something out of his left nostril by a minute 30. And then, we got a call. I tried to stop laughing so we didn't sound like retards on the radio. Uh, Medic 11 responding. It was my turn as patient person, so Brandon was driving. I was looking at the computer to see what the call was about, and the chief complaint said... Demons. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, your reaction was my reaction too. We basically rolled our eyes at whatever fucking dumbass and dispatch put that in for, so we were 100% sure that this was going to be some bullshit call. Probably a psych call or toe pain or something. It was a long response though. I mean, we're the closest unit and I think we were about 10 to 12 miles away. It was way out in the desert too, and we pull off the highway and started going down a dirt road towards the house. It was the only house probably within 20 miles. As we roll up to the property, my initial assessment of the scene was, this is creepy as hell. There were no cars out front, it was pitch black outside, and the house was glowing by candlelight. You could literally see every window of the house glowing orange, and you could see what looked like hundreds of candles. And so, typical of us, we started making demon jokes. We radioed in that we were on the scene though and we start knocking on the screen door. The front door was open and we could see inside. We could smell like incense kind of smells and the house was pretty smoky looking. This little tiny Mexican lady sweating her ass off lets us in the house. No English, she's holding a rosary and repeatedly makes the sign of the cross. And I am not lying to you guys when I say that there were candles just fucking everywhere. And it was instantly like 20 degrees warmer when we walked inside, wax puddling on some areas. She takes us into the living room and there's a 20-something year old male convulsing on the floor. The lady raised her voice and starts slapping me and she points to a fucking snake coiled up in the corner of the living room. It's a rattlesnake I think. She motions with her hands like a bite and clutches her arm and points to her patient. And now we have to upgrade the call since this is a rattlesnake bite victim at the fucking Mexican William Sonoma. We requested fire so that they could help us out and remove the snake. The snake was a good 9 or 10 feet away from the patient and seemed relaxed and not agitated so started looking for the location of the bite to begin treatment. As I'm setting up the O2 we start hearing screams coming from inside the house. Screams that I have never heard before in my life. Like fatigue almost. Last resort type screams. I look at the little Mexican lady and she looks just as concerned as me. 
Brandon goes down the hallway and I radio in again for the police. Brandon comes back, grabs me up by the collar and pulls me out of the house. I was like, yo dude, what the fuck? Get in. He jumps in the ambulance and locks the door after I close mine. This is fucked bro, Brandon said. I asked him what was going on and I'll never forget that he turned to me and he said, Listen, I just saw a guy eating his own fucking hand. That's right. Brandon went down the hall, turned into the first bedroom that he could, and said that there was a guy standing in the corner eating a bloody nub and with blood just all over his face and body. Brandon landlines dispatch on his cell phone and told them what was going on. I remember that he said, Uh, how do I put this, guys? Uh, listen, we're on the set of a fucking horror film right now. As we wait, the little Mexican lady comes out and falls to her knees crying and waving at us to come to her. The butthole perk factor is at full capacity at this point. The fire finally shows up and we get some confidence back. Strength in numbers type thing. We felt way less scared at this point, so we all go into the house. The captain puts the snake in a sack. We get the snake bite victim all hooked up and engine medic beelines for the hallway after we tell him about the guy bleeding in the first bedroom. The engine medic comes back. I'm not fucking going in there. The captain stops blowing out candles and goes down the hall. Whoa, 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 whoa. We all stop what we're doing. The captain is even freaking the fuck out. Guys, I swear to God that that motherfucker just floated instant goosebumps. The captain swears that he walked into the bedroom and the guy was fourish foot off the ground just spinning. Brandon and I look at each other as if to say, what in the actual hell is happening right now? The cops show up and detain the now combative guy biting his arm who just floated. We get the snake bite victim into our ambulance right before the captain almost requests a helicopter to have him airlifted due to the distance to the hospital and other factors in play. But we got him loaded up and we just bolt lights and sirens and get the hell out of there. Brandon is driving. I'm in the back of the rig with the patient. And at first I couldn't tell if it was the better lighting inside of our ambulance or what. But the patient looked so much better all of a sudden. Like a fine almost. His skins were good. Heart rate normal. He was just sort of staring at me too. And then I looked everywhere that I could within reason and found no signs of a bite or any bite marks. He just laid there on the gurney, all peaceful and quiet. We offload him and Brandon and I just sort of scratch our heads at first and then just go, what the fuck? Since we were still technically covering this district too, we had to return to the quarters, the fire station, and we catch back up with that fire crew from the call. And the fire crew said the same thing with the guy that was biting his arm. As soon as he left the house and got into the next ambulance, he started freaking out that his hand was missing. One of the firefighters was Mexican and actually spoke Spanish and said that the little old lady said that these two guys just appeared in her house. She was allegedly watching TV and they just popped up out of nowhere. She said that they were speaking like the devil so she called 911 and started reciting Hail Marys and lighting candles and sage and whatnot. The captain was having an existential crisis over allegedly witnessing another person floating through midair. He said the guy was floating and just kept flipping and flipping and flipping over. A few weeks go by and we get information from one of the responding officers that both of the guys, they were from Mexico. Both stated that they went to bed that night and woke up in that lady's house. And then we all started getting really into this and trying to figure out what happened. It's a lot of um, he said, she said stuff. A lot of it is factual though and I definitely know exactly what I saw. Anyway, that's the whole story and it's definitely changed my perception of things. I call it religion or the supernatural or whatever you want. It's creepy as fuck and creepy as fuck because it was real. They say that Machu Picchu is one of the most beautiful places in the world, and they're not lying. Surrounded by lush green vegetation, this ancient city was built by hand, 
stone laid upon stone and carved with the Andes Mountains centuries ago. It really is nothing but spectacular. But holy fuck, the heat. The horrible, beautiful heat. It was so oppressive, I'm ashamed to admit that I had wished to be transported back to an Edmonton winter and let the blistery cold wind soak down into my bones and make me forget that I had ever been that hot. And the stairs. Oh my goodness, the stairs. I didn't know that many stairs even existed in one place and going up them was absolutely brutal to say the least. Especially after the bus ride filled with stinking tourists all smushed together like a boiled can of sardines. I wasn't sure I was going to make it. At one point during the hike, delirious and exhausted, I envisioned myself lying face down on the trail, steps away from the top, dead from heat stroke while my cousin Melissa, whom I love dearly, apologized to the people as they sidestep around my stinking corpse. I'm so sorry. I told him to drink more water and put a hat on, but you know men she would say. Refusing to give her the satisfaction of watching me die, though, I dug deep into a reservoir of stamina that I didn't even know I possessed and completed the endless staircase of hell. After what felt like hours, we finally reached the city and it was magnificent. We stayed as long as we could, drinking in the beauty and mystery that is Machu Picchu, visiting the Temple of the Sun and the Room of the Three Windows. But alas, the day passed quickly and soon it was time to leave this beautiful place and descend the stairs back towards the dreaded sardine bus. And although it was much easier going down than up, my body was still exhausted from the morning's plight. I stopped beneath an overhanging tree looking for relief from the unrelenting heat but found none. I turned to Melissa who was also panting and drenched in sweat. I pointed to a small gap in the tree line in front of us. Hey, I'm pretty sure that that's a little path right there. Maybe the locals use it to walk around the forest? I'm gonna go and see if I can find a tree to lie down for half an hour because I'm dying out here. They said not to leave the trail, Michael. She always used my full name. You could stumble around and damage some of the ancient relics, you know. Honestly, Melissa, I'm done. All I want to do is fall asleep under a tree for like half an hour. Come with me or stay here. I don't fucking care. And with that, I left the trail, following the small path in the woods and refusing to look back out of spite. That'll teach her, I thought. The relief from the heat was immediate and I ended up walking further in than I expected, moving deeper into the forest away from the trail. I heard the rustle of leaves behind me as Melissa broke through the vegetation quickly catching up to me. I thought you were just finding a nap tree. Where are you going? I'm not sure. It was just so beautiful that I wanted to keep exploring. You know, get to see the real Machu Picchu, the one the tourists don't get to see. We soon spotted something just up the path, and as we approached, we realized it was a rectangular pool cut into the floor of the forest itself and surrounded by a terracotta tile. The dark jade water looked cool and inviting, free of debris and bugs like the water had just been skimmed by a helpful lifeguard. I ripped off my shirt and emptied my short pockets, making sure to throw my cell and wallet out of the splash zone and cannonballed into the cool water below. Oh my goodness, yes, I said as I swam in circles, letting the cool water envelop me in a refreshing hug. Michael, get out of there. Relax, I said, and I pointed to the platters of half-eaten fruit that lined the shallow end of the pool. But the other end opened to a gradual incline towards the shore. A perfectly designed walkout swimming pool. This is obviously where all the locals and the guides take their breaks and have a snack. I mean, come on, it's the perfect place. No one's around and there's no tourists to ask a thousand questions. I rolled my eyes and dived deep into the water, taking a mouthful of the jade liquid and spitting it at her like we did when we were kids in my parents' pool. She rolled her eyes and jumped away. Sufficiently cooled off, I exited the water along the beach and put my discarded clothes back on. I followed Melissa back through the forest, her heavy footsteps stomping loudly, her passive-aggressive way of letting me know that she was not impressed. We made good time though, and within ten minutes, we were back on the sun-scorched trail and on those god-awful stairs. Now, I don't know precisely when the first wave of pain hit. In truth, I had felt cramping in my stomach before we even arrived at the main trail, but I thought it was a bit of heat stroke or something. I hadn't drunk enough water and I had forgotten my hat on the bus, and so heat stroke seemed like a plausible explanation. 
I was determined to press forward though, but when that first real gut-crunching pain hit and left me gasping for air, gripping my stomach, there was no denying it. Something was wrong. And this was definitely not heat stroke. I could feel it under my hand, a small tennis ball sized thing squirming around, stretching my insides as it continued to grow. A strange lump protruded from my belly for a moment and then sank back in, like a baby kicking a mother's stomach, only this was not a baby. I prodded my abdomen trying to make sense of what was happening and felt it push against me, hard and foreign. I screamed at the sensation and fell to my knees as another wave of pain just took over. I heard Melissa yell for help and two tour guides ran towards us. <laughs> Something's inside of me! I cried, clutching my stomach and the thing living within it. It was now as large as a softball and growing fast. Without hesitation, they picked me up, draped me my arms over their shoulders and carried me off the trail into the forest. We'll take good care of you, they whispered, but I don't think that they were talking to me. My local man met us on the path a few hundred meters in and after a short exchange of words, he quickly intercepted Melissa behind us before she could go any further. I don't know what he said to her, but before I lost sight of her, she had turned back towards the main trail. She was always one to follow the rules anyway. My cold sweat soon covered my body and I could feel the creature growing inside of me, my internal organs shifting and rearranging themselves, making room for this new entity. The skin around my stomach burned as red angry stretch marks split into my sides across my abdomen. Another wave of searing pain ripped through me and I screamed, the world fading into darkness as I weaved in and out of consciousness. I awoke in a large hut, confused and half delirious from pain. I was naked and tied to a hard wooden reclined chair, my legs splayed open and bound to posts making it impossible to move. It reminded me, if I'm being honest, of a gynecological chair that I had seen in the doctor's office once when I was a child with my mother. I had asked her if it was for torture and she just laughed and said, No, 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 it's, uh, it's for checking on a lady's private parts, was all she said and quickly shushed me out of the room and into the waiting room. At my feet stood five women, dressed in traditional clothes with large vibrant flowers pleated through their hair. But two of the women held large platters of fresh fruit and flowers. The woman approached me slowly, talking quietly to me in a language that I couldn't understand and began coating my body in a floral-scented oil. They smiled in awe as they touched my protruding belly, watching as it moved towards their touch. An older woman approached from behind the chair, her dark skin a contrast to her light grey hair. She offered me a sweet-smelling drink and told me that it would help with the transition and dull the pain. I drank the cold liquid deeply, feeling it slide down my throat towards the creature where it seemed to roll around soaking up all the offering and I thought perhaps that this drink was not for me after all. But soon, the world around me began to melt into colour and sound, a new dimension of sight opened up and I found myself viewing everything from a distance. It was like no drug that I had ever taken before. I watched as the old woman cradled my belly, massaging the creature within as the woman began to softly sing. It was a beautiful song that sounded both ancient and familiar and I found myself humming along, lulled into submission by the song and the drink. It was like no drug that I had ever taken before, part hallucinogenic and part pain reliever. I felt the coldness of the blade against my skin only moments before my brain registered the pain. The old woman stood above me, gripping an ancient blade, as blood oozed out of the large slash that she had made along my stomach. The song quickly changed as the woman began chanting and dancing. I screamed in both pain and terror as I watched the creature's large dome-like head emerge, its jaws clicking loudly while two antennae and beady eyes searched the new environment for something familiar the room, erupted in cheers, and the woman surged towards it, coaxing the giant grub toward them with pleading arms and trays of fresh fruit. I screamed and struggled against my bindings, unable to contain my horror as its white translucent body, wet and covered in my bile and blood, crawled from within the cavity of my stomach. It slowly inched its way towards them, its six spiny legs digging into me as it clawed down my oiled skin, leaving bloody scratches like footsteps on a beach. As it climbed upon a platter, its small black beady eyes stared back at me, and for a moment, time stood still. 
the old woman smiled and bent towards me, her eyes filled with unshed tears. He chose a strong one this time. You did well, she said, and then the sweet darkness finally took me. I woke up days later to the stark bright fluorescent lighting of the hospital room. I found Melissa asleep beside me, curled up in a little ball on a chair that looked as uncomfortable as the wooden birthing chair that I was tied to. I found out later that she hadn't left my side the entire week that I was in a coma. The doctor that was assigned my case told me that I was very lucky to be alive. The tour guides had gotten me to the hospital just in time before the infection could spread. They told me that I caught some form of intestinal parasite, probably from something that I'd eaten a few days before at the outdoor market, which caused a mass infection in my bowels. After emergency surgery and my cocktail of strong antibiotics, I was expected to make a full recovery in time. The hospital staff refused to listen to my story of what really happened that day in the hut. They convinced Melissa and my parents that flew in that I had hallucinated it during the coma. It didn't matter that they had no explanation for the rope burns and the bruises on my wrists and ankles where I was bound to the birthing chair. I know that they're lying. I mean, the face of that thing is burned into my memory as real as the scar on my belly. I know that they're trying to keep it secret from prying eyes and unbelievers that would mock and try to disprove their ancient god, keeping it safe from those who would do it harm and rip it apart in the name of science. But please, whatever you do, stay on the trail at Machu Picchu. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support, and I'll see you mates in the next one.